Hello, hello, you beautiful, beautiful people. My name is Chloe. I am an ambassador of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, the God of Isaac, Abraham, and Jacob. And today we're going to be doing an interview by my sister in Christ. She's going to be asking me questions to basically share my testimony. A brief description of me. I am 23 years old, um, waiting for my husband. From born and raised in West Texas, currently living with my uncle. Elizabeth, can you please introduce yourself and take over the floor with your question? Hello, I'm Sister Liz. I'm from Hanford, California, and I'm going to be asking her questions about her testimony. But first of all, I want to know, how did you come to Christ and when? I came to Christ when I was 19 years old. Um, what had happened was everything in my life was falling apart. Uh, by the time of 19 years old, I was a stripper. I was a prostitute. I had a pimp face, literally. And um, it, it was clean. Everything was clean. Everything was with protection. He controlled everything. It was basically like a back page or whatever. Um, I was, by that time also, I was an alcoholic. I was drinking just about a bottle every single day. My choice was hard liquor, um, I mean, dark liquor. <laughs> and I was a pothead. I never really liked any other drugs, never did anything like that. And at that time as well, I had found out my mother was back in the streets. I found out my older brother, who I used to be close to, was back in jail. I found out my youngest brother that I went to raise from three months to three years old was in the system and getting ready to go into a foster home or was in a foster home, getting ready to get adopted. And at the same time, by the time I'm 19, I had grown really close with my grandfather and we had found that he was on his third type of cancer. And of course, it was before the pandemic was a pandemic. So all of these things were happening all at once and it broke me. So my um, my source to numb myself of choice was to alcohol. So I'm in my kitchen, I have my own apartment, and I'm, I'm drinking and I'm crying and I'm sobbing, and I hear two voices. So one of them tells me that I should go out and live my life, that I was young and my grandfather was going to die anyways. And the second voice, very, very different, two different voices, told me that I had to pick myself back up. I had to clean myself and be there for my grandfather. And with that, he would leave in peace. So immediately I knew one was the devil, one was God. And from that moment on, I knew that I had to make a change in my life. And that's basically what started my journey in relationship with Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sister Chloe, did anyone ever tell you about the Lord Jesus Christ before you hit the age of 19? Not really. So the crazy thing is that um, um, when I was 17, because I was okay, like I always had problems with my mom, right? So I, I went through, I went to three different high schools here in my city. I went to job for here in my city and my mom kept dropping me. My mom kept dropping me because my mom felt that it was best for me to get pregnant at a young age. It was best for me to go with my high school sweetheart and to stay in the project with him, to have kids and to have multiple kids with even different fathers to live off the government. That's basically what she wanted for me, right? So when she noticed that that wasn't my interest, she, she would drop me from school. She would kick me out of the house and she would tell the people that I ran away. So they would drop me to protect her. You know, so to get as far away from her as possible, I chose to go to a job court in Roswell, New Mexico which is a few hours from where I am. And um, I got there when I was 17. I took the longest, hardest trade, and I completed it in six months. I got my GED with college level scores in two weeks. I got my driver license, and I completed in electrical wiring. So by the time I came here, I graduated literally on my 18th birthday. So I came back home to El Paso, messaged with a different uncle that was always there when we were growing up, right? None of my uncles were blood. But um, they've been good to me. You know, they've never done me harm. They've, they've been good to me. So my grandfather was the only familiar person that I knew at the time. And him, of course, he always went to church. He's been in church basically longer than I've been alive. And so um, at that time, I was working a warehouse job six days a week, 12-hour shifts. And Sunday was my only day that I would that I was off. You know, so I felt that Sunday was the only day since we were going to church. I had that mentality that 
that was the only day that I could dress up and be a female since I really didn't care what I looked 12 hours in a day going in and leaving dark. You know what I mean? I, I really didn't care being around the same people, which was mainly men. And so Sundays, I would dress up. I, I, I loved heels. So I'd, I'd put on my makeup. I'd do my hair, dress up really nice. And um, so I went to church. <laughs> you know, I went to church from the time I was 18. And that's where it really started me going to church. But my mentality and my viewpoint of church was, oh, this is the place where I have to look nice. This is a place where I get to look nice. And even when I was dancing, I would I would be hungover at the church. I would be with last night's makeup at the church. You know what I mean? I'd be like not even knowing what's going on. And because our church still is very spiritually dead, it never penetrated me. And so one day after I noticed that, after God spoke to me and I knew that I needed to make a change in my life, um, I started paying attention to the word of God of my pastor of God, I started paying attention to the word of God and I had bought myself a Bible, um, very inexpensive, less than $20 at Barnes and Noble. I had bought myself a Bible and um, the words of God through my pastor started penetrating to me to the point where it was like, oh my goodness. And I knew that I had, God told me I had to get rebaptized because I was baptized as a kid, but I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't, I really don't know why. So I was baptized September 12th of 2021, and that's why I really took Christ serious. Okay. Um, when did you start having a prayer life? Was it after after you got baptized or before that? No. So um when like when everything had crumbled, um, I lost my apartment, I lost basically everything, and then I moved into my uncle's December of 2020 right December 2020 so while I was still in my apartment right after that encountered with Christ um I didn't I never prayed never prayed and so I started praying so I was in bed because I couldn't sleep you know I, I couldn't sleep and I was I was just there like laying down and um I started praying out loud and I, I felt the presence of the devil you know I felt the spirits that were around me and it's, a scripture came to my mind that I never read the bible you know by this time I never had a bible never read it never opened it nothing and a scripture came to my mind that I know now is a scripture where um, in Luke something, it talks about how God threw Satan from hell because he was disobedient, right? And so I remember saying that in my prayer. I was just like, that really happened? <laughs> you know, I didn't know. I really didn't know. So that's when I began to pray. And then after I got baptized, um, I got in contact. My tia, my tia, my tia, my tia, we're technically second cousins, but our age gap, she's my fiance. She, she was always real good to us when we were little. And so she found me on Facebook and she was really hardcore into Catholicism. She was telling me her testimony and the things that she's doing. And she was telling me, you know what, you need to fast. You know what, you're, you're living in sin. At this time, I was living with um, my most recent ex, which was like years ago now. And she was like, you, you need to fast, you need to fast a prayer. And she opened me up to fasting. So after I got baptized, I was like, no, I have to or before. But around that time, I, I fasted. You know, that was the first time I ever fasted for three days straight on an all-water fast. And I literally felt myself dying. And then from then on, I'm just like, this is amazing. <laughs> Did you ever feel Holy Ghost conviction while you were still going out, doing what you had to do? And then showing up at church. And was it mandatory for you to go to church on the weekends with your uncle? No, no. So I never, I never felt conviction. Um, I felt that it was something that I had to do. I felt that it was something that um, from a child that I was basically programmed into doing because it was easy for me, you know. Um, as a kid, my mother was very attractive. Um, single mother of five children out of five where she has four different fathers and so there was a lot of men coming in and at the house you know there was a lot of men coming in and at the house and they would buy her beer they would treat us out because um, they wanted to get to her and us being kids we knew that so we would rob them <laughs> we would rob them we would egg their cars we would hose them down we would put laxatives in their drinks and they would always come back you know so it was it was interesting, but I learned at a very young age how to manipulate men and how to get what I wanted um, from my parents. You know, I don't think I am the prettiest, but I know I'm not ugly. 
And I know that in the club, it was, I had to, I had to drink in order to do what I did, but I'm very good. I was, I was a very good, smooth talker in the Bible, talking about this woman. You know, I was very promiscuous. I was very vulgar. And I was good at selling a dream. And so, of course, I would make a good amount for doing that. But at the same time, I never felt conviction in my church, which is why I feel that it's spiritually dead. Even now, our our church is so known to cancer. You know, there's many, many um, elderly. I'm just about the youngest one there. And cancer is so known in our church. It's sad. You know, it's, it's very, very sad. And my grandfather... Um, he made it a point every single Sunday morning, and still does, to pick me up and take me to church. You know, we live about half an hour away. So this is like half an hour and then half an hour, you know, and that's been going on since I was about 18. But I felt like it was part of my schedule. I felt like it was something that I was going to do. You know, it was a time or two where I left the club early because I was like, no, I need to be in church tomorrow. You know, it wasn't because I was getting filled. It was just because it was something that I knew was in my schedule, you know? Yes, I have a question if you feel comfortable asking. Um, did you ever go through any danger, dangerous situation while you were out there? And did you feel that the Lord was there with you? Like as in he never left you? In a way, in I believe what? No, I was going to say, do you believe that, that, well, it depends if you were in a very dangerous situation when you were out there in the world still? No, not at all. No, um, no. So when I was in the club, I knew that there was, there was one incident that was like the most that had ever happened, basically. Um, I, I got dropped off. And then um, it was just a really weird night, you know, it was just a really weird night and I blacked out. And that's not just like that. I need to, I need to stop doing this, you know, because I started blacking out in the club. And then um, I know there was a few times where I was robbed, you know, and I didn't even know. I was just like, well, I, you know, there was um, one time I had just got a brand new iPhone and I had upgraded my grandfather's because he, he had always, I had hyped up the, the iPhone to him, I guess, to the point where he wanted one. So I got him one the same time I upgraded mine. We basically had an iPhone my whole life um and so that night which was a different night but it was a night that I did black out I remember my bag my money bag like the whole thing was missing you know and I was going to my friend I'm like hey where is it she's like no I saw you coming out from VIP it, it has to be in VIP and I was like no it's not there I don't know and she literally tore up the whole room like she tore up the whole room I was like you're crazy but she found my bag you know and the only thing that was in my bag was my phone so I was like okay well that's cool I talked to the manager and I was like, my dude, I don't want this. And I was like, I, I can't make you. I don't have any money. I was crying. I was crying. And then this was, and then she found my bag. And um, but that was like the the most like dangerous thing that's ever happened. Nothing really dramatic, whatever. But when I was with, um, cause, okay. Cause I had met the pimp. I had met the pimp through Facebook. I don't know how, but we, we were friends some way, somehow. And I started waitressing at a strip club. That's how it started. So he saw one of my stories. He said, oh, I didn't know you were a dancer. I was like, no, I'm a waitress. He's like, oh, he was hacking me up. Oh, you should do this. You should do that. I was like, no. And then um, an incident happened there. Well, I was just like, you know what? If they could do it, I could do it, but better. So then I, I got into that. And um, so there was one time, he's from Oakland. So, I mean, I'm pretty sure you know Oakland. You know the reputation of Oakland. And that is like a big thing there. I never heard of it. I never thought it was like a real thing here because I never experienced it, you know, but it's a real thing. And so he's from there and he was out here. And um, basically one time he had called me out there. He's like, hey, um, let's, I know this one club, get it, get it, get it. He needs to make it good for me out. I was like, okay, cool. So then I go down there and then he was with this one female and she looked a wreck. You know, she looked a wreck and she was from here. And that guy, he's he's good, but he's not like he's a good guy, but he's not honestly, he's not like like that's not normal. <laughs> you know, that's not normal. And so, and it's crazy too, because I believe that he was grown in a Christian household, you know. I mean, he's a good, he's a good guy, it's just not normal, you know, it's not normal. So the female, she's from here, and we're from the same side of town too. And she was telling me that one time she was walking 
um, Alameda, like the street, like a really big street here in this city to pay off some debt for her baby daddy, right? So this was nothing new to her. So I was, I was just like, okay, and we're just talking, right? So we're walking, but the whole time we're just talking and she's dressed like very, very slutty. And I'm just like in a t-shirt and jeans, you know, and but we're walking the streets where you could find that type of service. But the whole time we're just walking and talking, I'm just like, damn. So like, and she told me that while she was with him alone um, or doing that, but not alone with him, that some guy raped her, pulled a gun out of her and did his thing, you know? So, I mean, I've heard of the stories being, of the stories like that happening. But it's never happened to me, glory be to God. You know, and I know looking back on it that God was with me because I could have gone into so much more serious things. You know, I could have gone into drugs, but I didn't. That would have led to more stuff, you know. Okay. Um, what would you tell a young 19 year old girl? Like, if you could talk to yourself when you were younger, but now being who you are, a new creation in Christ. And what would you tell a young girl that, like, what would you tell yourself if you were to minister to someone who was living that lifestyle of stripping and prostitution and night, late nights at the clubs and that Honestly, sort of yeah. scene? Yeah, I would I would tell myself that it's not worth it because everybody thought that even my type of apartment, everybody thought it was a house. Even the way that I flaunted, because I would, I would flaunt my money. Everybody thought that it was a great thing to do and there was people messaging me. And females from high school that you would never imagine would even consider it asking me like, hey, like um, what do you think I should go and do this? Oh, I should do this, or you make it look so easy. And it's like they don't know that <laughs> I I had drinking so much alcohol one point to the where I was so dehydrated I would drink water and I would throw up the water. You know, they don't know that I had bruises all over my legs because it's not an easy job, you know, it's not an easy job. And um I would tell myself that it's not worth it. That even though the money was there, that was the only thing, you know, and it's not enough for what I had to go through, it's not enough or how I felt inside because I truly felt disgusted with myself. I truly felt like I was less than. I truly felt like I was worthless. I truly felt like I had to do that. And that was the only thing that I knew how to do. And it was the easiest, you know? Nobody was, seriously, nobody had accepted me for any jobs. Nobody had, I couldn't go to school because at the time I was independent and I needed a parent signature. My mom wasn't going to do it. My dad wasn't going to do it. You know, so I needed that somebody to better guide me and say hey you know what I know a better path you know I felt like I always did what I felt like I had to do and what I felt like was um appropriate at the time and of course my life just kind of led me into that direction it was like I know the option but the devil is a lie because um you know I'm doing God has me doing a lot of things right now and has me working with my hands in many projects and I know that I had to go through what I did to realize that even when the lies of the enemy comes where oh you know what you just need money you just need an easy fix you just need an easy come up that's that's not the case you know because money comes and goes and I was up to the point where I was worshiping it in a sense and it's not healthy you know? Um, did you go through deliverance before you actually stopped them and stuff like that? Before I actually what? Before you actually stopped working at the club, did you go through deliverance? No. Like at a church, did a passion deliverance? No. Do you think you did so a self-deliverance through the word purifying you? I do, I do. So um, I've never seen an in-person deliverance. I've never seen, um, never seen any of that. You know, my church is is not playing. Like if, if I were to show you a video of my church, you'd be like, oh, okay, that makes sense. It doesn't make sense for me to stay there, but God hasn't told me to leave, you know? And um, no, so basically the pandemic shut down my plan to go to the club. You know, basically um, I couldn't. I couldn't, they were all closed down. 
and then I wasn't gonna hit up one dude and be like, hey, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't, I was just like, no, because I felt like he used me. I felt like um, I had, I had, I had developed feelings for him, and when I started to show it, it kind of scared him off. And just to come and find out that he had those same feelings for me too, but it was just very, it was not, it was unnormal, you know, it was unnormal just that whole relationship. And so when I had first done my three day fast, I literally felt myself dying. And I know that there was something that broke off of me right then and there at that point, because when I came off of it, it was like, because I was, I wasn't, I was never so thirsty for the Lord. I was never so hungry for the Lord. And at that time, I was like really deep into the word because it was something new. It was something that I've never experienced. It was something that I never knew. And God really um, plans me. And even now, he, he still is. You know, nobody is perfect, but the scripture says, be ye perfect, for I am perfect. You know, so of course, this deliverance altogether is a continuous process, I believe. But I do feel like my main deliverance happened with that three-day fast when I had first started. So when you first started to come to Christ, you did a, you actually fasted on your own three whole days? Wow. So I think that's how you got your deliverance. Possibly a self-deliverance. Yes. Um, how would you describe your relationship with the Lord? I would describe it as, in a way, bittersweet, but yet so joyous, because through all of the pain that I had to go through to meet Christ, it's so sad to see that people around me aren't trying to look for him. It's so sad to see the people around me aren't trying to change, you know, and um, there's people around me that call me too religious. There's people that call me a holy roller and they mock me you know they mock Christ in front of me and it it hurts me because I try to be an example and practice what I preach but at the same time it's around people that are not trying to go that route you know and um it's it's me at the same time too because with my brother with my baby brother that went into that did get adopted um we met him, we met his family in a church, you know? So the crazy thing is that when I was younger, I used to live with a friend of mine and her grandmother used to go to this one church, right? And so I remember one time she invited us to this like ladies conference thingy, and I just remember we had tea and cookies. I don't know what it was about, but I remember we had tea and cookies. And so that same church, um, my sister, sister, you know, because her dad, I had a kid with another woman. So that sister to my sister said, called my sister one day and she's like, hey, I think your baby brother goes to my church. I'm like what? So then she comes into town and we go looking for this church and come to find that it's the same church that I had been to one time. And it's the church that my baby brother attends, you know? So then we meet um, the mother. I'm like, hey, this is our brother, you know? And then she lets us meet. Um, she took us out bowling. And even now, just the other day, he just turned 12, you know, so he is in my life. And it's, it's crazy how God will hurt us to bring joy into our life, you know, because it was, it was, it was a deep pain for me to have him leave my life since I'm the one that raised him for three months to three years. And so um, I was telling the other day, too, how my mom would manipulate me with him, you know, and she would get me to do things for her through him. And it got to a point where I'm just like, you know what, I, I can't do this. I love him, but I can't do this. This, this is wrong. You know, so for God to bring him back to us in the church and still have that relationship with him where we can call him up whenever we want, we can visit them whenever we want, vice versa. It's beautiful. You know, it's, it's bittersweet, but it's beautiful because I know that through me, my siblings that would never hear the gospel are hearing it. You know, and they're asking about it and they're asking about Christ and they're getting deeper into their word because I'm leading them in that direction. So for me, it's bittersweet, but in the most joyous way, you know? 